Thank you and uh, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the P is Powerful discussion. As you know, um, we're facing an energy crisis and today we're going to have a conversation uh, with Julie Freeman, um, the uh, director of uh, tra uh, Translating Nature, and Yanis Aropoulos, professor of engineering at Southampton University, and myself, I'm Rachel Armstrong, uh, the professor of regenerative architecture at uh, uh, Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. And we're here to talk about a new thermo economics, that the way that we use energy right now is not just destroying the planet, but actually has created a, an innovation condition that really is almost like an arms race where essentially solutions are found simply by throwing more energy at them. And the sources of energy that we have been using since the Industrial Revolution include fossil fuels, uh, which you know uh, come from trapped energy of living things that have been fossilized within the ground uh, through an incomplete decomposition process that happened around about a quarter of a billion years ago. And the creatures that unlock that energy in the living world are microbes. Um, and so we're going to introduce a set of characters for you that help us think towards a new thermoeconomics. And the reason that's important is because if we are not just going to reduce our present impacts, but actually find a strategy and an approach that changes the way that we think about, work with, and use energy. Um, this is really what's going to be able to create a revolution in technical innovation, in the way that we live, and most importantly, on our relationship with the planet. So you'll see a set of slides uh, behind us, um, and all of these are coming from the work that we have uh, collectively done together to explore what a platform might be that can help us find uh, or you know, start the conversations towards a, a new thermoeconomics. And we'll go into uh, details of those um, as, as the conversation unfolds. I also want to draw your attention to the installation Alice in the null sector. Um, and I don't know how many of you have seen that, but it's a rather fascinating, there it is, <laughs> looks something like this, a rather fascinating orb with no buttons that you can press. And during the conversation, you'll find out how you might interact with it in a future context. Please don't interact with it in that way uh, during this <laughs> festival. <laughs> Um, so, so yes, this is the, so the round plastic machine looking flashing thing uh, in, the, in the null sector is a, a prototype and a, and a version, uh, a, 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 a rendering of the techn technical platform uh, that we're working towards. So here she is, this is, this is Alice, and Alice has a bit of a history. Um, uh, Alice means um, active living infrastructure controlled environment, which really refers to a whole set of actors uh, working together to generate electrical energy. And that electrical energy, as we will find, is a low power energy. But what's interesting about it is that it is more than just the provision of energy. It also produces data and very importantly, the transfer of electrons in the process of uh, metabolism is creating chemical change. And so this is a platform that starts to work towards a circular economy based on the metabolism of living things. And critically, it is a platform that exists within the carrying capacity of any site in which it is introduced. So Alice comes from a progenitor project 
uh, a project that was called the Living Architecture Project. And that started in 2016 and ran until 2019 and was a collaboration between five different uh, groups, from University of Newcastle, University of West of England at the time, uh, Liquifer Systems Group, Explorer Biotech, University of Trento, and the Spanish National Research Council, all working together uh, to ask a question, which was how can we sequence metabolism, the metabolisms that were locked uh, in dead organisms in the fossil fuels that we use every day, can we actually use the creativity of living metabolisms and sequence them as if they were chemical apps uh, so that we could produce energy and perform work that we imagined at the level of a household. So this was the idea of having a living household and replacing your boiler, let's say, and, and all the single stream utilities that exist in a house, so water, air, electricity, gas, all of these are piped into a home uh, as, a, as a purified resource. Um, the Living Architecture Project proposed that it could handle all of these kinds of infrastructures simultaneously um, uh, based on uh, the household waste. And from this project, which was successfully uh, demonstrated as a proof of principle in 2019, um, we got together this uh, incredible team of researchers, uh, so from Translating Nature, University of Southampton, and now the University of uh, Catholic University of, of Leuven, um, to look at how we can take this idea of metabolic sequencing to produce living qualities of energy, those that were characteristic of Galvani and his uh, twitchy frog legs experiments, um, which exist within biology, and, and how can we actually take these um, into a technical uh, environment that could be used in all kinds of different contexts. So Alice came out of this, this question, um, focused on the microbial fuel cell as the prime metabolic unit that is driving the energy production and the chemical transformation of the, of the system. Um, and, and then also took the electrons produced as data, chemical transformation and power um, and showed them to us using digital uh, te techniques and technologies that really helped us get an understanding of the potential of the platform. So Alice is a demonstrator, it's a prototype, but it's also a visualization system to help us think better into the space. So we hope that this is the beginning of finding these uh, uh, new systems for uh, a, a, a revolutionary thermoeconomics which uh, is compatible uh, with the uh, energy use on the, on the planet. And so I want to, um, first of all, introduce Yanis uh, uh, Siropoulos. Um, and I would, Yanis, I just really want you to have a chat about um, the microbial fuel cell, which uh, is something that you've uh, taken and really pioneered to a, a new level of functionality, which has made uh, these kinds of prototypes possible. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, a wonderful introduction to uh, the technology and the work that has um, has been done thus far. Um, I'm going to talk up more about the technical side of, of things of the, of the microbial fuel cell. So, so the, the Alice artifact that you will see at the now sector consists of 15 individual microbial fuel cells. That's one particular architecture of microbial fuel cells. Um, the the state of the art where we've got the technology now is roughly a milliwatt for every five milliliters of wastewater that we're producing every, every day. So if you imagine, if we manage to get this energy density down to, um, or up to a milliwatt per milliliter, then we can start thinking how we can scale up uh, the technology. So what we see with the Alice um, uh, construction is the, this principle of multiple units connected together uh, electrically, but also 
uh, hydraulically so that we can treat the waste as as Rachel mentioned we can we can treat the waste that's how the microbes work they take the organic biomass from waste and, and turn it into electricity directly we get those microbes put them on an electrode surface and then we we take electrons out of their metabolism so the more efficient the, the system is, the more power we can get out. We're aiming for that one milliwatt for every milliliter of waste water that we generate. And then we can, we can think about back gardens uh, having buried systems. We can think about um, toilets with microbial fuel cell systems behind the service space. We can think about power generating wastewater treatment plants. We can think about gadgets that allow us to pee in them and produce electricity either to charge our phone on the go or to power a GPS locator if we were str uh, stranded in the middle of nowhere. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's been a journey. It's, it's a technology we've been developing for uh, 20 years and the, the level of performance has advanced uh, over the years. We're very happy to see the system where it is now and very much looking to make further improvements. And the only way to do that is by putting it in uh, context that we can get people uh, working with the technology, understanding it, um, and helping us progress in, in advance. So, Brilliant. Thank you, Yanis. Yes. But and what's so special about P? Because we've positioned urine is the next revolution in, in power generation in this particular tool. Mm -hmm. So what's special uh, about it? Well, pee is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, it's, it is ubiquitous. It is one of the reasons why we've, we've thought about uh, urine uh, directly. But of course, the technology can work with uh, municipal, industrial uh, wastewater. Uh, but, but urine is, is, is available wherever we have life. It can be human urine, it can be animal urine. We can have a farm wastewater feeding into the microbial uh, fuel cells. But there is the, the, the fact that we're able to take a, a, a human excreta directly into this device and turn it into electricity. There's, there's something compelling about that. There's a, there's a lot of carbon in urine. There is... Um, Nitrogen, of course, there's potassium, there's phosphorus, magnesium. These are elements that microbes, like the ones you see on the slide, uh, like. They, they need those elements for their own growth and maintenance. Urine has all of that. Mm. It also comes out at a nice warm temperature, body temperature and nice pH. Um, so it's, it's quite, a, quite a nice cocktail as a fuel for the, for the microbes. Fantastic. And, and those microbes, they really uh, make the most of that urine and turn it into, as we said just earlier, uh, chemical transformation, power, electrical power, but also data. And this is where I'd like to introduce uh, Julie Freeman, uh, who's a data artist, um, because she's been able to help us tell part of the story of this uh, new thermo-economic platform um, by her uh, incredible use of data art. So Julie, do you want to take us through as to how you approach the challenge that we gave you? Can, yeah, thanks, Rachel. So I, I do, yeah, I, I use a lot of data as, as an art material. One of the things that fascinated me about this project is not, is the idea of, a little bit the idea of recycling ourselves, because it feels like it's something that we don't do, and it feels like that's one of the reasons that, that this technology is seen to be maybe a bit like people don't want to touch it or it's a bit dirty. There's something about urine that people are kind of a bit squeamish about. So one of the, the, the big challenges is to, to create work that is engaging and beautiful and suddenly has, a, has, has something that is attractive about it, even though the fundamental ingredient is something that we don't really want to be um, touching and engaging with all the time. So. Um, the, the data that's harnessed from the system is what we use to create um, the data animation that goes with the, the physical structure, the sort of sculpture of Alice. And the animation looks at the different change in power from each of the microbial fuel cells. It looks pH value, looks at the flow rate of the, of the feedstock that's going in. 
And all of those different values are picked up and then um, sent to a server. And the way that they're collected is through a small onboard computer that's in, the, in Alice itself. And all of that is powered by the urine in, in the system. So it's like a self-powered artwork. And when you're making, make a lot of sort of digital artwork, one of the things that I think as digital artists we need to consider is the power we're using. So we're kind of part of this problem of making things that is consuming energy as well. So to create a piece of work that is sort of power in itself uh, is, a, is a statement, a sort of standalone statement anyway. But if you want to see, there's an animation that goes with it, if you want to see um, the sort of level of power that's being generated, you can go online to alice-interface.eu alice and there's, an in, there's, a, there's a data visualization that sits over the artwork and you can check um, in there and you can look at which data is, is, is being generated at any one time. And you've got different perspectives such as stains like for microbes and yeah. other parameters yeah. that are interesting to play around with and some great music. And there's a, yeah, there's a soundscape um, that, that goes with it as well, which is actually playing in Null Sector, but you can't hear it because of all the, all the bass that's coming out of their sound system. Um, so, yeah. so I just want to say that you know, while Alice is playful, it's visually attractive, and uh, there's some great ideas that are being explored in the installation. I mean, you installed uh, Alice at the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum uh, in September, which... Uh, uh, got a lot, a lot of attention. Yeah, I mean, one, one of, part of the reason to, to make artwork about science like this is to get people engaged with it, to get people talking about it, to spark a conversation. Nearly every single person I spoke to at the V&A ended up saying, wow, I had no idea this was possible. And that's, that is, you know, if we've even getting people to talk about it and then they're sharing that message, it's a way to make this kind of innovation and this technology become part of the, the infrastructures that we use in the future. And, and really important that it's part of a general conversation. Um, and, and I think the, the thing that we do want to emphasize is that although Alice in itself is a, an experimental prototype and demonstrator and a way of thinking through power being produced by microbes, data and chemical transformation, these technologies are also real. And Yanis has been um, installing, that's, that's great cue, uh, in, installing these uh, microbial fuel cells in real world context. Do you want to tell us a bit about that, Yanis? Sure, thank you, Rachel. So um, the first example that you see here is uh, the installation of Glastonbury Music Festival, which we have been doing uh, consecutively from uh, 2015. Uh, and we've, we've kind of scaled up the, the system. 2015 was a urinal for about 10 people. Uh, 2016, 2017, 2019 was a urinal for 45 people. So much more urine flowing through, much more electricity being generated. 2019 was the first uh, example of uh, the microbial fuel is connected to the lights inside the urinal directly, no batteries required for energy storage. So that was quite a breakthrough to do that during the festival. And the images you see now are from one of the field trials overseas. This is a girls' boarding school in rural Uganda, where we uh, installed a microbial fuel system to uh, light up the, the toilet, one of the two toilet blocks at the boarding school, which was previously unlit. Um, so the, the lights inside the cubicles would come on uh, PIR every time somebody would walk in and then turn automatically off. The light outside the toilet block was on an LDR, so it was lit through the night or at sunset um, and, and then sunrise going off. Um, and so these are real examples, evaluation examples that we need to facilitate to understand the limitations of the technology in those real environments. And so we can, we can then develop a, a, a better product which can be available for, for general use. And, and one, uh, one question we, we often get, uh, Rachel, if, if I may, is uh, how long these systems run for? Are the microbes kind of on their own life cycle? Do they, do they need to be replaced? So the example we can all relate with is our 
gut microflora. We have our own microbes in our gut for, for digestion. And unless there's something seriously wrong, we, we, we never go in and replace them. It's the same with, with microbial fuel cells. We, we encourage microbes to grow and attach themselves on the electrode surface. And for as long as we keep feeding them with fuel, and in this case, urine, then the microbes will continue growing and they'll continue generating electricity. So it, it can be very long term. And I, uh, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say, you, one of the, um, you talked about the uses, humanitarian uses of this kind of technology. So not just um, in, say, uh, uh, refugee camps, where it's not just power, the, the, it's not just dealing with the wastewater to, for, to give power, but it's also sanitizing the system as well. Correct. Uh, one, of the, one of the sectors we have been thinking about is indeed refugee camps uh, and, and emergency response and humanitarian kind of aid um, uh, agencies. Because this is a, a big problem, one of, the, one of the key challenges in refugee camps is what's, what goes on at night. Um, so having, having refugee camps better lit uh, is, a, is a good safety net that um, emergency and kind of humanitarian aid agencies are thinking about. And so this is, a, this is a system which treats the waste, which is of secondary kind of uh, concern, but, but uh, of, of primary concern, it provides that kind of lighting which makes refugee camps safer. And I think it's important to stress that uh, just because the field trials are taking place in uh, places that are off-grid um, and um, sites where the use of urine is uh, acceptable because it's something that's available, that these technologies actually also have uh, implications for the way that we live too. So if we think of P as power, uh, we need to think through what this platform is and what that would mean for us in the developed world uh, if we were to incorporate a, a principle of recycling our bodily wastes as the basis of a household uh, metabolic economic system. And I think what's quite interesting about this technology is that uh, it has a living technology, which is the, the microbes. Uh, and that microbes have been here way longer than we have. Uh, they are around 3.5 billion years old. And bacteria in particular have made metabolism their specialty. So if you give them enough of a challenge that microbes can certainly adapt to and invent uh, in metabolic ways. So, in the last 10 years or so, we've developed technologies that allow us to see microbes in ways that previously we couldn't see them before with 16 sRNA probes and uh, systems that can not only see individual bacteria, which was you know, what was happening in the 17th century with Hook, um, and then with Pasteur and Koch, but in the 21st century, we can now see populations of microbes as ecosystems themselves. And we know that those ecosystems are inside us as the human microbiome, but they're also all around us in the microbiome of the built environment and in the urban microbiomes that are around our built spaces. So if these technologies, these metabolic technologies are around us everywhere, and if they are in our bodies, and then we have a relationship with these urine collecting and fecal collecting systems, um, then we have a relationship with that technology and that technology is also an extension of us in some way. Um, and so that it might mean that there are different performances from household to household. Uh, it might also mean that the microbes that we have inoculated into our homes that process different forms of waste need to be cared for by us and can have a relationship with us through the kinds of technologies and interfaces that Julie's been uh, designing so that maybe, and this is something that's in the online system, that uh, you can play with the microbial icons to actually feed the microbes in the laboratory uh, with a, with, a, with a nutrient, or even slightly heat them with some lights. 
Um, so the, this relationship between human and microbe can be interrogated through this platform because we know when our microbes are happy because they're making more electricity, they're cleaning the water faster, they're creating lots of different um, vitamins or detoxifying wastes. Uh, so, so there's something really interesting about a technology that's also living. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and this is, yeah, and this is, and, and, and I think this also in, introduces ethical uh, relations uh, with our, uh, with the invention and the innovation in, in, into this space. But I mean, I, I think it would be really nice if we had, I can imagine the EMF, the next EMF, where we have some kind of gamification of, you know, donating your urine and seeing who is literally who is most powerful. Yeah, don't do that today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please don't piss on Alice. <laughs> But that, you know, having that in your home and as a family, so getting to understand what your body is producing yeah. and, and what you can eat that changes the, the way that your body is producing waste is really a good way of learning about yourself, about your family members, about how, uh, how my, microbes can act. And it's, you know, the more we understand about our planet at large yeah. at, on an organic level, it's got to be. And, and I think in that way, we become producers as well as consumers. We always talk about energy consumption but you know, can we actually participate in this process by the things that we do and need to do? Yeah. So, so maybe we can make the data and in two years' time yeah. to come back with a, a system which <laughs> will allow us to see whose urine is the most powerful. <laughs> <laughs> will it ring a bell? That? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, 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 uh, you know, so essentially when we have a, so we can think of the ALICE system really as a kind of microbial cyborg, you know, potentially the first microbial cyborg, it's soft innards, maybe they're a brain, maybe it's a gut, maybe it's some kind of flesh, if we think of the biofilm as a, an active entity that probably exists in its functional uh, performance as, as, as a thing that we don't really have good words to describe yet, but it's in relationship to technologies that we know. Um, and I can see that uh, by changing maybe the materialities of the system, so instead of having uh, printed plastics that contain the microbial chambers with, um, that are separated by ceramic plates, that maybe we could have soft materials like aerogels or, um, uh, you know, uh, grown up uh, bioprinting um, systems so that actually when we integrate all these different elements we're actually designing a new kind of organ for our home that does this multifunctionality of processing water, generating electrical power and uh, creating a whole range of metabolic uh, transformations. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, the, the last things, I, I know that we're, we're probably coming to the, the end of the talk, um, but I, I just want to say that I, I think that this is a, a real platform, uh, a platform that creates some insights into how we might be able to go forward differently. And I think the things like setting a 12 volt limit on energy consumption, not saying that we need 230 volts in every house. Maybe we can think of a 12 volt lifestyle forever, 12 volt being the maximum of energy that, that, that we use. Uh, and it means that we may need to innovate in different ways for the kinds of things that we take for granted uh, about how we do things in a household, like washing our clothes or cooling things. Maybe we can use new materials for that. Um, and along with that 12 volt um, energy, cap, let's say, that we can also understand that um, uh, our bodies and our health can also be um, sensed by these systems because microbes are not just machines, they are also sensors and that they can read environment much better than we can. So there's a new opportunity here for really thinking about our bodies and environments and being able to bioremediate very strategically before we release anything beyond the household uh, in, in, into the world. And I think finally, this really does give us some clues as to how a new thermo uh, thermoeconomics may be 
possible, the economics being provided by a metabolism, the way we live in the world, the things that we need to exchange, um, and that although we may be able to save some energy and put some energy by, being able to create huge sums of energy and creating these huge inequalities that come with the way that we uh, think economically and we perform technologically in the world, uh, that maybe this is a kinder, softer, more evenly distributed system than the ones that exist today. So I think we'd like to invite you all to go to the, uh, uh, the, the null, null, yeah, null sector. Uh, have a look at Alice with, through a microbial lens um, and uh, see how you feel about its uh, semi-technical, semi-living uh, status and whether this is something that you would like to care for in your home. <laughs>